Good afternoon, everybody. It is so great to have you here. I am Jackie Terraza. I am the Caroline Mussey Director here at the Colby College Museum of Art, and it is just a huge pleasure to gather with you. We have just an, an amazing afternoon and evening, and then tomorrow, for those of you who can join us tomorrow. Um, just some practical things. Uh, please silence your beeping devices and cell phones. And we are live streaming, so I welcome those of you who are in this room, but also those of you who are joining us from afar. I'm very glad that we'll be able to do that and also share the video after, after today and you know, in the near future. The occasion for this gathering is, of course, painted our bodies, hearts, and village, an installation that is comprised mostly by work of works of art in the Kobe Museum's collection with some select loans. And I hope that many of you have already had a chance to see it. And of course, there will be many other opportunities right after this um, and tomorrow to explore the exhibition and the galleries. Painted has been in many ways and will continue to be a multi-year endeavor to shift research, pedagogy, public understanding, and importantly, museum practice related to art made about and by indigenous people. It also seeks to move the needle also further along on the role that indigenous artists, curators, scholars, and others can play within art museums. And of course, we cannot do this alone, and I think I cannot underscore that enough. Many of you in this room have been doing this work and working towards this larger goal for much longer than we have, and I thank you for it. And thank you, thank everybody who is um, also working alongside um, in this endeavor. For the Colby Museum, this effort of organizing this project has benefited from having the financial confidence to do things we had never done before and to give time to what has been necessarily an emergent process of relationship building and of learning in community and in collaboration. I want to thank the Lunder Foundation and Peter and Paula Lunder for giving to the Colby Museum an incredible collection of art, including amazing paintings by those affiliated with the Taos Society of Artists. I also thank them for establishing the funding to continually activate and support the Lunder Collection at Colby as a resource for research, for teaching, and for learning, and of course, for enjoyment. And Peter and Paula and some of the members of the foundation are both here in the room and virtually, so we say thank you and hello. And I think the Mellon Foundation, which provided initial support for the Colby Museum's Lunder Institute uh, for American Art to organize a cohort of research fellows to pursue original scholarship on artistic modernisms of the Southwest. And that cohort was led by Professor Jessica Horton of the University of Delaware and by invitation of Tanya Sheehan, who's a professor here at Colby, who really conceptualized that cohort. I thank the Terra Foundation for American Art for granting the museum one, is, if one of its first collection reinstallation grants, a really visionary initiative that has allowed us to do so much with this particular project. And I'm so glad that Sharon is here with us as well. And <laughs> you're much loved here. <laughs> Painted takes 24 paintings from the Lunder Collection, all made in the early part of the 20th century, and uses these works as a point of departure to tell a new art history, one that emphasizes the sovereignty of Pueblo peoples and the land that they steward. It invites viewers to consider how art, how the, how art produced in the United States Southwest reflects or diverges from the lived experiences of Native community members. Belief, time, creativity, and trust as enacted by our partners, by supporters, and by staff across the museum are principles that have enabled us to shape the project and to continue to learn from it. And I'm deeply grateful for the relationships that have been facilitated on behalf of this project, starting with those established by Wabanaki artists and culture bearers and by expert advisors in Maine, before, during, and following an earlier exhibition here at the Colby Museum, We Wanikin, The Beauty We Carry, without which the current project would not be imaginable. It was our Wabanaki partners, and especially Teresa Secord and Sarah Sokbison, both members of the Painted Advisory Council, who helped us see the importance of seizing, 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 
as in C's, the opportunity to connect the histories of American art in the Southwest to the vibrant cultural traditions of Native artists in Maine. My thanks to the Lunder Institute Research Fellows who helped, better, helped us better understand not only our holdings, but the potential of this project. And my thanks to the tribal leaders, organizations, individuals, and others who hosted us in Taos and Santa Fe last year in the early stage of the process. Also, we would not be here without that visit and your hosting. My thanks to the institutional and individual lenders to Painted. And most of all, I also want to acknowledge the terrific staff of the Colby Museum. Sierra Height, who's right here in front, an enrolled citizen of the Cherokee Nation, and a lead member of the curatorial team is now manager of programs at the Lunder Institute, programs and fellowships. And she orchestrated this symposium with the many partners and facilitated the curatorial process for Painted. And Sierra, a round of applause. <laughs> few more things. Um, Sierra worked with head curator Beth Finch and also with Megan Carey, our Barbara Alphon director of exhibitions and publications and with so many others to make uh, painted possible. I offer my utmost gratitude to those who helped us evolve this project into one that manifests a Pueblo worldview. Many of you have traveled from afar to be here with us today. Juan Lucero, with an Isleta Pueblo um, creative uh, curator, and Jill Albert Yoey, who worked in collaboration with Sierra Height, really are the co curators and the kind of um, visionaries of this exhibition. Virgil Ortiz, a Cochiti Pueblo maker, whose work you see in the exhibition and on the walls, and is really responsible for that wonderful exhibition design. In close collaboration, I have to thank also with Tisha Goyo, who is essential behind the scenes maker of so much happen. A curatorial advisory council made up of Pueblo and Wabanaki artists and stakeholders provided essential guidance on the installation and interpretation. And the council members are Ron Martinez, Looking Elk of Isleta Pueblo and Taos Pueblo, Patricia Michaels of Taos Pueblo, Teresa Secord, Penobscot, Sarah Sockbison, who's a Penobscot maker, and Dr. Joseph Suina, who's a Cochiti Pueblo culture bearer and scholar. So many of the artists represented in the exhibition also offered connections and guidance and challenged us in the best way possible to think in new ways. The Colby Museum was founded in 1959 as an educational resource for the college, as a community and cultural gem for this region, and as an instigator of projects of national importance. We have remained consistent in that purpose. And at the heart of the Colby Museums today, in terms of our mission, is access to art and artists and our role as a forum for experimentation, research, dialogue, and creative connection. With this symposium, with this installation, with the publication that will follow, and with many programs, we seek to cause an unlearning and to simultaneously offer a new way forward, one that affords a more layered and more human understanding of the complexities of the American experience. And it is now my pleasure to turn things over and introduce Teresa Secord, who is a renowned basket maker, educator, community organizer, cultural leader, and amazing advisor, and who has served on the board of governors of the Colby Museum since 2018. I'll turn it to you. Thank you. Uh, Willie one Jackie, yes. Don Coxidouen, Nilouis Delas Secord, Bozina Dakad, Bona Webskik. I was telling people I'm a little bit nervous because I'm about to introduce my language teacher <laughs> to open the um, symposium in a good way, especially to welcome our um, special um, guests and curators. Um, Duane is a remarkable language and culture bearer, also. Um, the director of the Passamaquoddy Museum at Zabayak. If you're watching the Native American uh, Native America series on PBS right now, he's in episode four, Language is Life, and he's representing us well here in our homelands. Um, Duane is the translator of the um, 
1890 wax cylinder recordings, which happen to be the oldest recordings of indigenous voices in the world, and they are of the Passamaquoddy people, his ancestors. And so I think he's gonna share a song from the wax cylinder recordings, and um, he's here to open the symposium and welcome everyone in a good way to our Wabala Wabanaki homelands. Take it away, Dwayne. <laughs> for that beautiful song and that blessing for this, this event. We're so grateful for your presence here tonight and um, so grateful that you are all also here with us and uh, to those who are uh, joining us uh, virtually, we're also so glad you're here. 
My name is Beth Finch, and I am the head curator here at the Colby Museum. So, um, Virgil, <laughs> Juan, Teresa, and Sierra. Um, I'm going to start with a few brief introductions just to give it a little bit more substance of how you came to this project. And then, um, and then we'll take, in a sense, a tour of the exhibition with a few slides um, to, to dig into some of the themes and, and how this all came together. So Teresa, I wanted to start with you. Um, in the late 1980s on Indian Island, you learned to weave from Madeline Comer Shea. Like your teacher, the sharing of cultural knowledge became your mission as well as your lead, and your leadership of the Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance brought new life to the art form of ash and sweetgrass basketry by lowering the average age of basket makers and increasing their numbers. Virgil, you are an artist who grew up in a family deeply generationally committed to creativity. You work in a wide array of arenas, including ceramics and fashion, and now exhibition design. <laughs> Your 1680, 2080 project, which I expect we'll touch on in this conversation, is a through line in your art, which is dedicated to resisting, or as you have noted, reversing oppression through the transmission of cultural knowledge and understanding. And Juan, as a member of the Isleta, of Isleta Pueblo, you have pursued deep knowledge of the history and present day practice of Pueblo pottery. You have held fellowships at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. I had the good fortune to see your beautiful exhibition there, Parska Shada. And, the, and you have also held a fellowship at the Lunder Institute, as Jackie noted. And your association with the Lunder Institute led to your role as co-curator of uh, the Painted Project. Your current work at the First Peoples Fund supports native art professional development, and you are also pursuing a master's in museum studies at the University of Oklahoma. We're also very grateful you came with your family um, to Waterville, so thank you for being here. And Jill, as associate curator of Native American Art at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, you and Juan uh, worked closely together there on the reinstallation of Mia's Native American galleries, and they are stunning and beautiful and uh, so illuminate, illuminating and revelatory. You are an expert on Navia, Navajo weaving and have organized many exhibitions, including the Landmark Project, Hearts of Our People, Native Women Artists, and you very, very recently, recently opened in our hands <coughs> Native Photography, 1890 to now. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> And like Juan, your fellowship at the Lunder Institute led to your role in the exhibition we are discussing this evening. And Sierra, you are my wonderful Colby colleague who uh, moved with her family west to east um, in the midst of the pandemic, first to begin a curatorial fellowship and then as assistant curator of modern and contemporary art and now as the program manager of the Lunder Institute. As Jackie noted, you are a member of the Cherokee Nation. You are also a curator, writer, and artist who has a gift for bringing people together. So here we are. Um, when we talked about this conversation, um, we wanted to focus on the methods, the methodology of how it all came together. Um, but I have to say, as I thought about how to shape this conversation, that that word felt a little cold um, for what you actually accomplished. Um, you have accomplished ways of creating something collaboratively. Um, you have brought all those values of that, um, in, inherent to that work, to the task of this exhibition. And you have brought a tremendous heartfulness to it as well. So I'm excited to um, talk about the ways of, all, of how this exhibition came together. And we will um, circle around um, the space of, uh, that you organized. Um, but I actually would like to begin with, um, in the fifth gallery, um, the one dedicated to matriarchal themes. With this image, um, and if you, you may have seen it on, um, on a label 
in a part of the installation. I'll show it to you here. Uh, just there in the corner, um, it, it's there, is that stacked image. And um, Jackie touched so wonderfully in her introduction on the importance of um, how we went about this project in the context of the Wabanaki homelands. And when um, the research fellows first came to Colby, that was something they helped us understand in dialogue with uh, the Wabanaki um, community members who uh, came to that, um, that program. So I wanted to start, Teresa, perhaps for you to say a few words about this and how this, um, these two images came together um, and, and entered the gallery. Okay, uh, yes, I'll just be brief. Um, this is a photo that I've shown often, um, 1953 photo of my great-grandmother selling her baskets on the Penobscot Indian Reservation here in Maine, Indian Island. And um, also a photo of um, another renowned artist, Nampeo, which I think is significantly earlier. But one of the things we looked at was, you know, how can we um, integrate, like, the Wabanaki work into this exhibition in that, you know, we were building upon the Wiwinikan momentum and really didn't want to become invisible again in our own homelands. As we had stated earlier, the Wiwinikan was the first um, exhibition of Wabanaki art in a fine art museum anywhere ever. And so it was very gracious of these uh, wonderful co-curators to allow us to include our basketry in the exhibition here and kind of set the stage. But I guess the other thing I would say is um, one of the commonalities we found was that I know a lot of the artists in the exhibition here because of our collaborations and we see each other in the Santa Fe Indian Market, the Herd Guild Museum Indian Fair and Market. And so um, I know, you know Virgil and Jeremy Frey are friends and so it's just mm -hmm. kind of like similar value systems. Wonderful. And, and I know that um, how to how to do that, right? How to bring Wabanaki baskets into the exhibition was one of the things that the council discussed. And I, I, I'm hoping, Juan, you might be able to speak about the, the design solution you arrived at for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that was quite easy because I think I grew up, I grew up in a Pueblo home. So one of the things that we do, and we don't necessarily put it on display, but it actually sits with a lot of our pottery and a lot of the things that we cherish will sit on top of our cabinets in the home. Um, and this will be like in the kitchen and everything. And I, I grew up with my mom once a year pulling down pottery that my grandmother made or our relatives made from the tops of the cabinet and just washing them in the sink. So it was always, it wasn't until I entered like the museum world where I was like, oh, okay, you're <laughs> pulling pottery off of the top of the cabinet <laughs> and you're washing it in the sink. I don't know how I feel about this. I know. It was completely normal for me growing up, but I think that was one of the things that you go to a Pueblo home, and I'm sure you'll see it at Virgil's home, or um, as we, we do put our pottery on display. It's, it's something that we're really proud of. It's something that our relatives made. I myself don't make pottery. I, I, every now and then if I have to make something, I'll make something. But it's <laughs> usually, I'm really proud of the things that I get during like dance ceremonies. Uh, my uncle would always gift us pottery. He was a, he was a really well-known pottery maker. And um, we would take those and we put them on display. We don't necessarily always use them, but a lot of our our pottery does get used in the home. It's used for uh, serving soup, serving anything, really. We try to find ways where we can incorporate it into our lives. And we're really proud of the things that our relatives are able to do. And not to call anybody out, but actually Nampeo is Michael mm -hmm. Nominka's uh, <laughs> great-grandmother, great-great-grandmother. Mm -hmm. And I'm really happy that Michael can be here to be a part <laughs> of that to get as a well. Photo so. together. <laughs> but yeah, I just wanted to this exhibition to reflect that. And it actually really works well because it holds in place those relationships we make at places like the Indian Market in Santa Fe. And I think that's one of my favorite days is on Sunday after everything and everybody's shutting down. And you see all the artists kind of running around from booth to booth trying to make those trades. 
because they have their, 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 their pots or their baskets or whatever they, they didn't sell that they want to trade with other artists. So I think that's probably one of my favorite times of Indian market is to see that happening. And I just wanted that to be reflected and how it reflects the Pueblo home, but then also reflects those relationships that are made throughout um, Native America and how our artists are so tied in with each other across the country. And, and Juan, you've, you mentioned, we've mentioned two grandmothers now in the context <laughs> of, of this, and in the context of this particular gallery, um, which focused on um, you know, artworks, women, imagery of women, and, and artworks uh, that women had made. Um, so just to go back to the shelf and, and the baskets and the pots there, um, I wonder, Jill or Sierra, would you like to say something more about, about that arrangement or this gallery? Well, I'll say with this, I think that we immediately understood what Juan was trying to share and that we wanted to, to be something that wasn't fussy and it to be filled, as you said, with heart mm -hmm. um, and to bring that as an experience into the galleries. I think that's important. Yeah, and I think also just um, in terms of relationships, um, uh, even just within that one particular shelf, I think there's a work by Clara Neptune Kieser and Teresa Neptune Gardner. So there are also other familial um, relationships between women artists represented within that one particular gallery, um, which I think is something that runs throughout the show, but particularly within that space. Yeah. yeah. Just one, one other note. I like to push uh, museums to display things how they wouldn't necessarily want to display things, like putting pottery <laughs> and baskets <laughs> up on a high shelf. <laughs> it's kind of fun to make preparators a little uncomfortable through the whole process <laughs> of the installation. So, uh, this was the like uh, shout out to our collections team and preparators who are amazing. Uh, this was the display they were um, the least worried about <laughs> because <laughs> no one could touch anything. So. <laughs> we will get to that. Um, yeah. But let's, um, let's start back at the beginning um, and actually begin with, with this image, um, the, the translator, right, Virgil? Um, and I, I'd like for you to speak perhaps a bit about why this image and why this placement. I think it was really awesome to have the opportunity to work at and uh, design with all of you guys this whole exhibition. And it feels very um, Pueblo style. Like, um, I hope everybody gets that whole feeling when you walk into this exhibition of like how warm all of our homes are at in the Pueblos. We tried to portray that and share it with you guys. But this image is um, of the translator character. And I've been developing a storyline about the 1680 Pueblo Revolt, which nobody hardly knows about. And I wanted to really reach out to the next generation of the demographic of a younger uh, movie-going uh, crowd of like how I was really uh, influenced by science fiction as a kid. So like Star Wars around Star Trek, Battlestar Galactica, all these types of movies really influenced me when I was six years old, like when the first Star Wars movie came out. I really learned about all the characters, what they, how the ships they cruised in, their, how they looked, how they spoke. And uh, to reimagine uh, the 1680 Pueblo Revolt, um, because it's not taught in our schools, it's not in our, um, in our textbooks, basically being swept under the carpet because of the genocide that happened to our Pueblo people. So it's just like, I, I, okay, I'm like, how am I gonna uh, try to convey this to this generation and us in, in general? Like, um, to have like fantastical images like this and sci-fi characters. So I told the story happening simultaneously in 1680 and 2180 so that um, it's happening in two different time dimensions. So I'm able to design the storyline from that point of view to bring in a, a, a cast of a characters. And um, if you, you guys all know about Star Wars, I'm sure, like the character Yoda, he's kind of like the, the grandmaster of it all, the OG person in there, but uh, so like the translator is that type of character. So he's able to translate from the spirit world to uh, the human world now of how to aid and help 
Pope, the leader of the Pueblo Revolt, and also the main character for women empowerment, the leader of the Blind Archers, to help portray them to um, help pull out the Pueblo Revolt in 1680 and 2180. So he presides quite prominently in the center of, of, this, of this wing, of the whole wing, really. Um, so quite, quite um, spectacular. This work um, by Ken Romero um, is also uh, part of how I think you have brilliantly conceived how to center a Pueblo worldview or worldviews and to literally do that physically in the galleries. As we can see um, with the placement of this work, um, which requires um, coming up close to it and looking at it carefully um, and seeing, um, you know, from what it's made of, a, a landscape. Um, but I wondered, Juan, if you would like to speak a little bit about this work, its, its choice, and its, and its placement. Well, I've been working with Ken Romero since probably around 2005, 2006. Um, I used to sell his jewelry. And I've been a big fan of Ken Romero and the work that he does for a really long time because it really reflects um, one of my favorite jewelers, Charles Lolama, who was from Hopi, and some of the work that he's done. But in regards to the exhibition, this piece actually has a lot of architecture to it. It reflects how the community of Taos is actually built, and you kind of see that in a different the landscape of the stones itself um, and just the rarity of the stones that he's actually using. A lot of the coral that is on there is actually old coral. He's purchased this coral from years ago that, and coral isn't mined anymore. Um, it's no longer legal to mine coral the way that we used to. So a lot of the coral that you're going to see is old coral. So that's what he has here. But I think that's just one of the most beautiful things. And the mater other materials are like walrus tusk, um, fossilized walrus tusk, glapis, and turquoise. And tur New Mexico in general is known for its turquoise. And not only its turquoise, but its mines and the way that it's used in a lot of the um, jewelry that you're going to see. But I really wanted this, not only because I have a relationship with Ken, but then I don't think there's anything else architecturally that really speaks to the um, how how beautiful our landscape is in New Mexico and how beautiful our Pueblo communities are. And it's really reflected in this piece. And even, even the fact that it's stamped underneath the bracelet itself, I think that's reflective of what's inside our communities and what's inside the Pueblo home that is really reflected. You really have to examine the whole pieces itself. I think we wanted to place a, a mirror underneath so you could actually see the stamp work that's underneath because it's very meticulous and it's very well thought out and well placed on the bracelet. But um, it's, some, it, it, it's, it's one of those things that's almost like better kept hidden because it makes you explore, really explore the piece itself. But I, I don't think there's any way that there's not a better piece that really reflects the beauty of Pueblo community and Pueblo culture and Pueblo architecture other than this one. And then the other thing too is that really re is re a reflection of that is the label itself. Um, it makes me really hungry, first of all. He <laughs> talks about Pueblo, um, it talks about Pueblo feast day and red chili stew and he can smell that and he can hear the dances and the people and the community and that's really what I really aim for in a lot of the interpretation aspects of the exhibition is to transport people to um, the Southwest, to transport people to the native Pueblo communities in New Mexico and I think I've always talked about how it's impossible to transport smell but this label that he wrote for the, I really can smell the red chili, I can smell the fresh bread, I can smell um, just everybody around us, the wood burning in the fireplaces. It's, it's a really, I don't think there's any way to, other way to introduce people to the, to the exhibition other than this bracelet because it says so much. Just with itself as an object, but it's the label as well just adds so much to it. So I think it's a great introduction 
to the exhibition itself. Wonderful, thank you. And you're right, so Ken did write, he wrote this label, and there were many other contributors to the label, prod, to the labels and other aspects of the didactics, um, or really the interpretation, I guess. Um, a didactics would feel like the wrong word, I think. <laughs> but one of, but I think I'd love to hear you, Jill, speak a little bit about how you approached that multi, multi-vocal, multiple contributors, contributions. It's so key to how you approach the curatorial practice. Um, and how, how did that figure in the, your collaborative work together? Well, I think that um, there is great beauty in multivocality um, in many ways. And I think that hearing the voices and perspectives of, in, in this case, of Pueblo um, and some non-Pueblo artists um, in this exhibition brings life and brings experience that is usually unavailable in an art museum context. And um, it's also important to rethink how we typically are understood in art history. Um, I'm an anthropologist, so it was all very weird <coughs> to me, but this idea of curatorial authority, you know, the idea that one single individual, no matter who they are, has the expertise to say what something is in, in an exhibition. And for me, as a non-Native person, and being taught over many, many years, I know how much I don't know. You know? <laughs> I know how much I don't know. And, but I do know people who do know. <laughs> um, and so, um, Taking a perspective, a curatorial perspective of understanding that there's beauty and a symphony that is created with multiple voices, giving many different um, experiences. <laughs> and it also upends all of these narratives that um, have been through the history of Native art curation and art curation of of um, the monolithic understanding of Native people um, as a homogenized single narrative, um, and, it, and that there's such variability and such beauty in that variability within Native nations, within Native artists, with, with all of that perspective, and that those perspectives are, are ground us in a new way of apprehending and um, feelings when we encounter these works in the galleries. So Jill and Juan, you so beautifully connected, you know, that connection to the, the voices, the, the landscape, um, the, the community, um, and from that cuff, um, if you take a turn to the left, you will come upon, you will begin to see some of the TSA paintings, um, the first on the left there, and I think I have it here in full. Um, and I think that, you know, what you were saying, Jill, about um, the beauty of that, of those voices, of the many voices, I guess I, I would say that's what these paintings needed, um, and there's certainly more, more information needed, more knowledge that needs to be shared, um, but I think that that was what we were hoping to find through this project, and I, again, I just want to thank you all, and I'm so um, in awe of the project <coughs> that you were able to develop together. Um, this particular uh, painting is called The Sunlight of Taos. Um, which is a very distinctive aspect of uh, New Mexico and Taos. Um, and um, there are, it's also a conversation among friends, right? That's part of the title of this work. Um, I'm wondering about here too, since this was the first work uh, by the TSA that you placed in the exhibition, your placement of it, the choice of this work, um, if, if any of you would like to say something about that. Sierra, would you like to, or? 
Oh, well, I can start. Okay. And maybe I love to hear um, the label that goes with this one, which one wrote is one of my favorites in the show. But um, when we were talking about uh, how we would install the galleries, I think one thing we landed on with this work, and correct me or jump in if I'm wrong, but um, the, I think all three of us were really drawn to an image of like multiple people coming together and the sense of community that this particular painting had. Um, a lot of the portraits, there's just um, one sitter. So with this one to see, you know, like the title says, people in conversation with one another and to see that exchange felt really um, appropriate. But I think also um, the setting and yeah, Juan, I don't know if you want to talk about the label a little bit or your thoughts. Um. <laughs> or not. <laughs> <laughs> Tread lightly. <laughs> so, and in this painting, I, it's, it's very welcoming. It's opening the door to visiting one of our communities, one of our Pueblo villages. Um, I come from a, 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 a Pueblo, a village just south of Albuquerque called Isleta Pueblo. Um, we in the past have experienced a certain a certain degree of exploitation from our community. Um, in the night, around the same time period, we were visited by Elsie Clues Parsons. Um, she approached our pueblo about writing a book and writing about our ceremonial practices. Our ceremony leaders, our community leaders, actually said no, and they didn't allow her to record anything or take anything down. Um, but what happened at that point is she paid somebody under the table. She found a community member that was willing to go out and create paintings and talk about the ceremonial practices of our people. And that is a book that was widely distributed at the time. Um, I made it a, a kind of a journey of mine in life to eventually buy up all those books and get rid of them. <laughs> Because there is some very sensitive material in there. There's a lot of um, ceremonial practices that in some instances we don't even have anymore. Um, and it's, it's, it, it's very disheartening to hear those kind of stories because I know it's happened to other pueblos and other communities as well. And not saying that that happened with the TSA painters, but I think with this painting, it's, it's, it's very welcoming. Our people are very welcoming. And we are very open to sharing our culture and our, our ceremonial practices to a certain extent. Um, and one of the, and I think for me, writing this label is kind of reaching back into some other things that I've worked on as, um, with Dr. Sweeno, not to keep calling people from the audience, but Dr. Jos <laughs> Joseph Sweeno over here. Um, we in an exhibition that we put together at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, there was a couple paintings in there that I, I actually, that were painted by uh, Tony da Pena. Um, and they were of a certain dance in Cochiri de Pueblo that is closed off to the public now. And there is a certain sense of cultural sensitivity there that Dr. Sweeney didn't feel it would be appropriate for the community to see in Minneapolis. So we actually covered those paintings up and this is all his idea. I just followed his lead. <laughs> <laughs> we, we put covers over the paintings. We covered them with um, glassine so you couldn't actually see the paintings themselves and we'd still put them on display. But Dr. Sweeno um, had just finished writing a chapter in a book about um, cultural sensitivity. So that actually worked really well because he was able to write a label as to why certain knowledges aren't shared with the public. Um, but as far as this, this painting goes, we want people to come in and visit us. We want to share our culture with everybody. But it's important to keep in mind that we are not there for amusement. We are not there for um, exploitation. We really want you to take in our community, take in our culture. But please do not take it out and share it where it's not supposed to be shared. And I think that's the important thing in this, um, the, important, the important aspect of the label that I wrote that is kind of in there, it's kind of hidden, it's for you to kind of figure it out on your own, but it's also, the, I don't think it would be appropriate for me to 
right in there at the end that will hunt you down after you leave and start sharing those. <laughs> but I, I, I think for me, like I say, I open by saying tread lightly because I, I think for us, we really want to share what we have. And I, I think Virgil can speak to that as well. As we, can, we want to share what we have, but we want you to take care of it, cherish it. Um, don't, 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 don't show, don't, it's not yours to take with you and not, it's not yours to share beyond our communities. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add, Virgil. No, I think it's, uh, this painting is awesome. And do you think they're talking about non-Indigenous people or people from the Pueblo? Right? <laughs> <laughs> they're like, oh, do you see what she's wearing? Do you want to go to that? <laughs> Well, Did you hear how Victor was singing last night? <laughs> you, you go tell him, not me. <laughs> I think, I mean, it's welcoming and stuff, but like now, like I try to talk to, like, uh, again, like Dr. Suina's um, son, Jeff, is one of the mentors. Uh, I look at Mr., I don't know what to call you, because like I work, we serve together in, in office in Cochiti, so he was like Umo to me, which means father. Then also he was a governor, and so then I, I don't know what to call him now. <laughs> but Dr. Sweena, so it was just like his son Jeff is um, now picking up the clay, which his family did as well. So just to be able to um, not only take our family's designs of the pottery, of what we all did, because like each family has kind of crest designs to uh, our family's pottery designs, but also like there are some certain designs that we can't share that is only meant to be at the Pueblo. So we have to be really aware, and that's why I try to teach all the other up and coming um, artists to be aware of what you put on the internet because you will get plagiarized and you will, people will take from what's not supposed to be taken. So, but just it's our, our point as well is to like not put stuff that is not supposed to be shared. So um, that's one of my teachings that I try to do is just to be aware of what we put out there. But um, again, back to it, it's like, who are they talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so um, part of what you shared with us, Virgil, um, are the designs on the walls. Um, and um, you know, I've, having spent some you know, time in the exhibition, I've thought about the translator as like kind of the backbone at some, at some, in some way, and then um, this begins with um, a spine design, I believe. Um, and uh, you may have noticed, um, if you've been in the exhibition, had time in the exhibition to no notice that those designs begin in the, um, in the ramp. And then, but once they're on the walls, they're, they're only on the outside walls. So it creates, in a sense, a kind of vessel. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, would you like to say a few uh, you know, say something about this design choice. And yeah, definitely. Like Dwayne said earlier, like we're all we're all one people. We're all come from everything that I do. All my artwork, I know it's way bigger than I am. I learned that when I was like 16 years old. Like it's way bigger than what I'm doing. It's to continue our people's work. And I know I'm just a bead in a necklace at this point. But I have to feel. I feel that I'm only here um, on this planet to make sure that our traditional pottery does not die out because it is a dying art form, but, um, and also to educate globally about the 1680 Pueblo Revolt um, using art. So now these designs are also like uh, throughout indigenous uh, de design works and all, but like in, in Cochiti pottery, a lot of this re represents like the mountains and also what I learned from our grandmother, Lawrence to her and our mom, Seferino Ortiz, they, were painted as, and they told me it was like mountains and also the Kiva step ladders that are in our ceremonial homes in, 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 in our Pueblo. So I wanted to just share that a lot of the, the Pueblo homes and the practice houses that we do have, they have design work in, within the, um, on the walls. So I thought it would have been kind of cool to have that uh, place on the outside to just hold everybody together, whoever walks through this exhibition to really make them feel warm and experience again um, who we are as Pueblo people and uh, Wabanaki people as well out here, like how we all, we're all together operating as one. And we're still here li uh, living and thriving and creating. Wonderful, thank you. Um, this would be a good place to point out the 
the spots in the exhibition where you were able to advocate for not having, and our colleagues in, in our exhibitions team um, supported that to create mounts so that uh, things could be displayed without, uh, without plastic covers over them. Um, and nearby, um, this particular work um, by Jody Naranjo Falwell is, uh, and this is it, uh, without, its, without any covering, is this work by Sarah Sockbeeson. Um, one of the works that we were able to acquire the uh, work by Jody Naranjo uh, Falwell. Um, Teresa, we have to thank you as, as, as our guide and advisor um, to, help, to help locate that work. Um, but we were- Something really quick yes, about please. that piece, only not to take away from Sarah's work, because I'm super, super amazed and proud of this. That just, um, I'm a member of the, of course, the governing board of the museum here and on the collections and impact committee which is you know, a really honored place to be. And I felt it was really important and I'm so proud of our work in collecting and acquiring um, work by important women and indigenous artists you know, who are contemporary. Um, Jody is a potter and a, the matriarch of a you know, renowned family of potters at Santa Clara Pueblo. And I think she's a really important artist and she's the mother, of course, of Susan Falwell. So I just think who is like, here today. Oh, great. <laughs> Hi, Susan. <laughs> but just how fortunate we are as a museum, you know, to be able to acquire yeah. remarkable pieces like this from remarkable people. Yeah. Thank you. And to also commission works, including this, this ba basket. Um, Sarah will be speaking tomorrow and is here with us as well. We're so happy you're here with us. Um, and this, too, is displayed without that Plexi bonnet, we were able to display it with, without. Sierra, would you like to say a few words about this commission or wait until tomorrow? I'll say a couple words, although, yeah, Sarah will speak to it much better <laughs> than I can. But um, in this gallery or section, which is focused on homelands and land stewardship, to you know, Virgil and Dwayne's point about us all being connected and thinking about how to make sure that we were respecting the fact that the museum is on Wabanaki territory and thinking about how we engage um, with uh, communities here that we hold a responsibility to and thinking about potential connections. We felt like it was really important to also think about the ways that Wabanaki artists in particular, and I mean, Teresa, again, I feel like almost self-conscious saying this in front of you because I'm like, you could speak to it way better, <laughs> but have been a huge force for um, uh, protecting um, the state of Maine in this region from the emerald ash borer and thinking about other forms of environmental protection and really being like a lead voice for that issue in particular. And so to invite Sarah to be able to complete a commission that uses these alternative materials and draws attention to that issue and also just highlights like the incredible innovation um, that, that artists can expand upon uh, traditional mediums, if given the opportunity, um, was really important for us uh, to lead off the show. And it is, you've told me how you made it like probably a hundred times at this point, and I still don't understand <laughs> <laughs> how you were able to do this <laughs> um, in a, a short amount of time also. <laughs> this is also an, an, an object that it would be wonderful to hear the artists talk about how this absolutely beautiful painting was made. But um, this, uh, another important aspect of your work is to have, of this project is to have work, contemporaneous works, so historical works, works that would be contemporaneous with the TSA generation um, as part of this. Um, so Popshali, Taos Pueblo, um, this particular work is a loan from Jay Fell, who is a, a Colby <coughs> alum. Um, <coughs> Would any of you, would any of you like to say more about this aspect of the project? I have another image here. Perhaps Virgil, mm -hmm. um, you could speak <laughs> to this work, which you were so important to identifying. This, you identified it for us. Yeah, this, uh, the historical Cochiti figurative pottery. Um, <coughs> the figures are really amazing. Like our family, even though we come from a long uh, line of uh, pottery makers and um, 
a lot of us didn't know about these pieces from the 1800s. So what they all are based on are social commentary. So I thought it would fit when we're barely starting to talk about this exhibition, mm -hmm. um, like about the Tao Society of Artists like posing indigenous people to paint them. I was like, I think it'll be so cool to have some of like of, uh, of the other pueblos as well to um, have their commentary of, of non-indigenous people. So I was like, man, Coach Adif had been doing these figures that um, are really like a timeline, creating a timeline, and especially like when the railroads were being laid in our area, it brought more people, more um, more people into the area. So along with more people, more um, entertainment came in the area. So there was like a lot of operas that popped up, a lot of circus sideshows. So you see all these uh, cool characters that. Um, depicting all of the, which are my favorite, were the circus sideshows. <laughs> so they look more like like fashion looking kind of mm -hmm. stuff, like more odd, odd looking kind of figures. And a lot of people say I'm innovative, but I'm like, no way, that's not me, it's way bigger than me because that gives me the chance to show them pictures of these historical works. Mm -hmm. That um, I'm like, I'm only reviving what our people did uh, before, long time ago, and it's like um, nobody credits them until they actually see them. And a lot of these pieces, were um, collected and by one of our family members, friends uh, named Robert Gallegos. He was out of Albuquerque. So I was like maybe 16 years old when I first seen these pieces in person. Mm -hmm. And he was a family friend doing, he owned a gallery, so he would do buying trips to Cochiti. And what would, I mean, he knew me since I was six years old. <laughs> so it was, um, we would know, like our mom would say like, okay, uh, we called him Uncle Bob at that point. So he was like, Uncle Bob's coming to buy Pottery pieces get ready for it, so I just copied what my parents were doing. So Coach Dio is known for the storyteller figure. But um, after a certain time, I started making all these figures that were standing and painting them really weird that my parents didn't t t teach me or my siblings. And Bob noticed. He was like, who's teaching this kid how to do all these weird, <laughs> weird figures? <laughs> <laughs> and my parents just said, like, well, he's just experimenting. And they always supported all of my siblings and I. And he was like, at that point, we had never been to a showroom in Albuquerque. And he said, please bring him down here. So uh, my parents and I um, paid him a visit. And we walked in there. And like, our, I always tell this story because it's so amazing. It changed my life because we walked into his showroom. And our, we almost passed out. I, my parents and I you know, like looked at it at his showroom. And it was the first time Like it turned out that Bob Gagos had the largest collection of historic Cochiti de figurative pottery from the 1800s. And, what I was experimenting on and all of my pieces when I was 16 or 17 looked exactly like them. So I was like, it was an aha moment. And like, my parents pulled me out of the showroom and they said like, um, we didn't teach you any of this. We didn't know these were here. Um, and like, and they just told me like the remember this day because the clay mother is talking to you and through you. Um, it's just a special day because we didn't, again, didn't, we never seen this, we didn't teach you, but they're really like, ancestral memory or like reincarnation or something that had my mind to be able to make these pieces. So at that point, I knew I was going to go to higher education because I knew I was going to dedicate my life to clay, to the clay mother, and hopefully connect that um, our historical work to the next generation of potters now. Mm -hmm. So um, from then on now, I just based my whole um, storytelling off of the pieces that were from the 1800s because they're all based on social commentary. So that leaves the doors wide open to um, commenting on political stuff or whatever, like my travels that I go um, around the world and recreate these images and these people in clay. So it's like a timeline, <laughs> a newspaper, if you will, basically. So you can look at all these older pieces from the 1800s that are depicting non-indigenous people. So I thought that would be a perfect uh, commentary, like to have them in conversation within this exhibition. And I, I, I love seeing them here, that they're traveling all way out here. Yeah. And it's so hard to get to this size um, now in Cochiti because all the masters are, are passing away. But to bring back this size is one of my main goals. And also, like, again, I was talking about um, Jeff Suina, Dr. Suina's son, is to really instill in them, like show them these historical works to try to bring these works back. Mm -hmm. That gets to so beautifully the kind of the, the, the ways behind this project um, and the connection between the past and the present. Um, I wonder, Jill, if you had anything you wanted to add um, to this aspect, this way of this project. 
Um, in what way? <laughs> what well, do you mean? The, the, the why, you know, it, I think Virgil represents how important it, is, it was to his work, and in a sense, this connection to this historical work emerged um, from him <laughs> yeah. um, generationally. Um, so I guess that, that um, you know, the having works, this, this is from the late 19th century, but mm -hmm. um, someone like Pop Chalee, who would have been working in, essentially in the same decades as the TSA artists, why was that important to you all? I think that was discussed by our advisors, um, mm -hmm. people like Patricia, who um, really thought that it was important for us. It, did I have that right? That they wanted to make sure that there was representation of 2D artists mm -hmm. who were working at the same, around the same time as um, the TSA painters. Yeah, and there's also a painting in the show by Albert Looking Elk, who is the great grandfather of um, Ron uh, Looking Elk, who couldn't be here tonight. Um, but so that was another really special connection, and we were able to get a loan of one of his paintings too, and also um, was a sitter for the TSA. So multiple connections, but yeah, that came from the council, yeah, mm -hmm. specifically. And those back and forth, so those conversations that are happening in the galleries at every moment of TSA paintings and depictions of Pueblo people in the paintings and contemporary art responding. Um, it, it, you know, it, it's a, to me, it, it's a revolutionary show because to my knowledge, I'm not aware of any um, situation in which there's been an exhibition of TSA painters um, who have been paired um, in this respect and have been um, indigenized, um, or I say virgilized. <laughs> <laughs> um, in such a way, um, and it's truly incredible to have that experience. And I just will say that we all feel like the works the, these TSA paintings have never looked so beautiful. They're beautiful, beautiful paintings. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about that. But as they are exhibited in this show, they couldn't be more beautiful. Um, they're, tend they're tended to mm -hmm. through a Pueblo perspectives. They're enwrapped. Mm -hmm. They're made to be at home in a truly different way. This is a really wonderful pairing we were able to work with, uh, this is from the um, historic mm -hmm. counts, work with yeah. Davison um, and Wonder Fellows who work at, um, it, at the Cowles historic site. We saw this image of, um, is this Jerry? Or? Like, look out to Davison. <laughs> one, of, so. one of the, uh, Jerry, <laughs> yes. Uh, one of the sitters for TSA painters. Mm -hmm. And he was wearing these moccasins. And one of the things when I came into, as a Lunder Fellow, I saw all this within the TSA paintings. I saw art of women, of Native women. I saw it everywhere. I saw it in pottery. I saw it in clothing. I saw it in beadwork. Um, and I was really interested in understanding the art within the art itself. And um, we were able to have lens, the original, the wor those um, moccasins that were um, featured in the painting itself and bring them together in Maine, <laughs> in, you know, a right? uh, hundred years later. And how really wonderful cool. is that? And then to have another layer of having Jessa Ray growing thunder, you know, from a, an incredible beading, bead artist family to be able to reflect upon that, adding to those layers. So adding, you know, and adding understanding of the TSA paintings themselves through the lens of Native. That was, I think that's fundamentally what the show is. And I think even another layer here um, with working with Virgil, like in this particular instance, um, we yes. were talking with Virgil about um, asking like for solutions or ideas for how to display these particular works in a way that would like really activate them for our visitors. And I think like the care that you brought into it with 
if you haven't been into the galleries yet, there's two-way glass that creates basically like an unending, infinite, um, infinite yeah, yeah, like an ongoing, um, almost like multi-multi-generational understanding of these practices, and so to <laughs> invite so many different like collaborators just into this one. I'm, I'm so glad you let me do yeah. that because <laughs> I was like, okay, like I'm, we're gonna bring in two-way mirrors uh, for this, for this, uh, <laughs> the vitrine and this one. But I, it's such a subtle um, detail, but massive in a way as well because um, I've worked with two-way uh, two mirrors like this where it makes everything infinite when you're looking at it. So if you guys look at this, these particular moccasins that are in display kind of go around it because it's against the wall, right? Mm -hmm. So if you can go on three sides of it, it's infinite. And I really wanted to portray the like how many of our people, the spirits that took, uh, that are all part of this whole show, um, again, like it's infinite. So you'll see these moccasins, like thousands of moccasins in there. <laughs> and it's just a way to get that message across. And I mean, you, you'll probably feel it by yourself, but just to point that out, to look, look at it mm -hmm. and just imagine how many of our people are in the spirit world and also with us right now. Beautiful, thank you. And and I would also mention, related to Jessica Ray, Growing Thunder, that we were able to acquire a work yes. as mm -hmm. one of her works as well. So mm -hmm. um, to have both her, all of her, her full expertise <laughs> represented yeah. in mm -hmm. the galleries. I didn't know all of that, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And this slide represents um, the mm -hmm. members of the Abeda family who um, contributed to this project. Tony Abeda, um, this was one of the important works that um, you know, <coughs> uh, helped us to understand one of the ways forward with this project by uh, when, this, when this painting was acquired on the upper left. And then um, the other works that you see here, a video, a work by Margot Abeda, um, and, the, um, and the dress made uh, designed by Patricia Michaels. And there are other family connections throughout the gallery, so not solely, solely these, the Namingas. Um, uh, the Falwells, et cetera, et cetera, and as we, as we begin this conversation. Um, but this is one of the places where um, I feel like there was a beautiful tending, um, to use a word that you um, mentioned uh, a moment ago, uh, and to make those connections vibrantly um, present. Um, I'm looking to see if anyone wanted to say, we have just a few couple more slides after this. Did you want to say something, Juan, here? The um, family aspect of it. <laughs> no, uh, just kind of ref going back on what Virgil said about the infinite mirror. Um, I think when we sit down to create or we sit down to do anything that, or to do our work, I think as Pueblo people and as indigenous people in general, I think we sit down with the understanding that we're not alone. Our ancestors are there with us. Our ancestors are I'm gonna, <laughs> our, our family. They're people that came before us are there with us and they're sitting with us through this. And they're working with us and giving us the strength to do the work that we're doing. So I think in thinking in that manner, I, I think this piece in general is really powerful in that sense. But then also with Patricia Michaels and Tony and their kids all being included in this exhibition and then with the connection with Michael and Nampeo. And it's, it's important to remember that our, our relations are always there with us. We're never alone in the work that we do. And our spiritual connection is very strong within our Pueblo communities. And I really hope that's reflected through this exhibition because we, I, I think, like, I mean, just going back to Virgil's design, it's like a big hug. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is. It's like a big warm hug. It and is. I really hope that's that's really uh, translated to everybody through it this. Is. So. A big warm hug. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, this this small vessel, beautiful vessel, is um, put here in this wonderful place. And I wondered, Virgil, if, if you wanted to speak about the blind archers and the connections between this, this warm hug. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, like women in our Pueblo do so much work. Our mom and I have four older sisters and I 
through all my sisters and my brother that had kids, they all, I mean, <laughs> I have 43 nieces and nephews now, <laughs> so that we live all across the country, but it's just like when we come together, especially for our feast day dances on July 14th, they come back home and we're able to all get together and laugh and eat together and, and um, dance with our, our, our Pueblo. But um, I, their characters are called the blind archers. So they're, I wanted, um, Pope is the leader of the, of the Pueblo Revolt, and he was from Okay Winget Pueblo, but I wanted to bring a strong woman character into the picture. So I, her, um, her character's name is called Ta'u. Ta'u is what their grandmothers and their granddaughters address each other in, in Pueblo in Kojiti Pueblo, and uh, we're just at a gathering in the Pueblo during our All Souls Day celebration, and that's all you hear is like the grandmas and the granddaughters addressing each other as Ta'u, you hear that, Ta'u, 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 everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it, um, you know you're home, you know, you're because I travel a lot working and I'm barely at, at Kojiti, like maybe four months out of the year, because I'm um, all over the place. <laughs> and, but. When you get back home, I always like, you know, our, our sisters, our moms, they're, they're the ones that are cooking, doing all the hard work. They, they're, they're the backbone, backbone of our community. So I really want to portray them, uh, women empowerment, and really strong, uh, as you see here, like um, superheroes in a way. So you'll, every work that you see online is always talking about our past, our present, and our, and our prayer for the future. So I, um, I just wanted to um, hold them in higher regards of all the work that they do in the Pueblo. So um, this, uh, in the matriarchal room, I thought that was a really um, cool image to be a part of, with, uh, of this room. And also like the painted designs or the, um, the wildflower designs and that to me represents also women empowerment. I would like to give a shout out to the preparators for in this room because one of the most brilliant things in this room is the white painted tops of the vitrines mm -hmm. there because mm -hmm. I, I was really afraid that they were the pieces of pottery were going to get lost but they painted it white so the black pottery actually really stands out and i was like oh my god that's genius <laughs> <laughs> most powerful thing i'm stealing that i'm sorry <laughs> Okay, so um, we just have a minute or so left, but I, I wanted to um, end with this image, um, which looks back at the blind archers, um, but also to this beautiful weaving by Bergina Charlie. Um, at the beginning, we were looking at the cuff, right, um, as a center, and, um, and um, I was hoping you could speak about how you place this work here, and a little bit about this gallery, which really, there is no end. This is the Futurism Gallery, so this isn't the last gallery. It's the Futurism Gallery. <laughs> um, Virgil, do you want to speak a bit, and then maybe about uh, Juan as well? Yeah, of course. I just think, I mean, it was so fun designing this whole um, exhibition with you all, and like, brought it brought us together, like, how many Zooms did we do, and <laughs> phone calls, and... <laughs> trying to figure it, out, figure it out because it was during the COVID years and um, we made it happen. So it was very, I'm very proud of it to be um, a, a part of, but like the, the hanging, at first you guys were gonna put this on a mannequin, weren't we? Mm -hmm. And then like all of a sudden it changed the idea to hang it and suspend it and mm -hmm. it worked out really well. And I think that was, whose idea was that? I can't remember. I think it was Juan. Yeah. Was it? So I think. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. Too many zooms. <laughs> <laughs> it worked out really well, and that's uh, that, I mean the the end outcome of it is like brilliant how it looks. So uh, now I'm still in that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the idea for this is actually my good friend um, back in Minneapolis. She's a textile conservator, and she uh, she worked on the exhibition we did at Mia. What we did in that room is we created a kind of a mock-up of Taos Pueblo with pottery all over the top. And over the top of the, the little village that we built in the gallery, we had uh, mantas up on top. And in my thought process and the way I think about exhibitions is that those textiles over the village were acting as rain clouds. And the way she hung it up was kind of like this. And that's what I see when I see this textile here is I see 
a cloud with the rain falling beneath it. I honestly think it should be this mm -hmm. way. But the way <laughs> it's sitting there, I, I really, I, the way it's hanging is just inspiration from my friend Beth, um, who is a textile conservator in Minneapolis. And if she's watching this, I'm calling you out, Beth. Thank you, Beth. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that's where that comes from. But then also it, it speaks to how Native people see artwork and how we create our, our, our work. We don't see it as just objects. We see it as our relationships around us with our environment, with our people. Um, and I think this is a good way to kind of speak to that because, like I said, I see clouds and rain. Uh, I don't know what anybody else sees, but that's, that's what I see. And I think that's pretty universal for like, especially for Pueblo people to look at this, we're gonna see clouds and rain. Right. It works so differently, especially like a manta, right? Hanging as a flat object. Yeah. Uh, it looks like a painting and it works both ways. Mm -hmm. I think it's really brilliant how you, how you hung it up. Well, we um, are a little bit past the hour. Um, so we are going to continue this conversation with you in the lobby of the museum. Um, I want to thank Juan, Jill, Teresa, and Sierra for the opportunity to be in dialogue. And thank you for creating this beautiful exhibition and bringing so many collaborators to contribute to it as well. We're so grateful.